Hello, Alexandre. Hello, Rose. So you are a sound meditation facilitator. Maybe for those who don't know, what is sound healing? And uh, why you don't like so much the term of sound healing? You prefer sound meditation. Yes, good question. Um, this practice is known out there as sound healing, sometimes sound bath, and people use other terms to describe it. It all describes the same thing. Um, I do prefer to call it sound meditation, although it's not a term that I coined, it's been around. I found it to be more suitable, more descriptive to what's really happening. Because for me, words create reality. If we call it sound healing, then you go to the experience expected to be healed, but you don't know who's going to heal you, the practitioner or the sound itself. There's no awareness on what you need to do. Sound bath doesn't mean much. You're bathing in sound. Sound meditation communicates a lot, communicates active participation, presence of the mind. You are doing something. Because healing, it puts the person in a passive mode in it, a way. Exactly. I believe in healing as an inner process. Uh, another term that we use loosely is we call practitioners healers. But if we were to scrutinize whether they really heal or not, they more create the conditions for healing to happen. They create the experience. They give the tools and the knowledge of how to use the tools. They keep the person safe working on track, they support, encourage, push, they, they have a vital role, but at the end they're not healing, they're creating the conditions for healing to happen from within the person, but the person has to be present, attentive, and aware of what to do to create that healing, how to seek it, or get out of the way to allow the self-healing process to take place as they work with it. And what is special about you is that uh, you're talking to people before you're explaining what is um, a sound meditation and mm -hmm. what in which mood or in which states they should be. Yeah, it's a very important part that I call contextualization, creating the context of where I talk to people for a certain length of time to explain to them what is going on here, how I perceive and understand things so that they work with me, they are on the same wavelength and there's no assumption that if I, we don't talk about it, I leave it up to them to perceive it in any way they want, label it or have an expectation. When we are on the same wavelength, then we're both co-creating the experience. So it's a curated experience with the involvement of the receiver and the receiver is an active participant, um, aware of how to use the tools in a knowledgeable, sensible, skillful way to be able to achieve the most important thing in the experience, uh, being disconnected from the monkey mind, going into hypnagogic state, state of being, rejuvenating state to, uh, you know, have presence in the experience and be able to achieve agency. That's just the most important thing. So can you explain me the, the process of a good um, sound meditation? Mm -hmm. uh, people come to the experience and I talk for a certain length of time explaining um, concepts depending on the length of the experience. If the experience is longer, let's say four hours, I may talk for an hour to give them a lot of tools. If it's two hours, I will talk for half an hour. So there's plenty of material to cover 10 hours. Uh, and then I um, start with breath work to get them to disconnect from the habitual patterns and, and the cognitive loops. Um, lying down, eyes closed, or they could choose to sit up if you want, uh, doing diaphragmatic breathing exercises and followed by toning and vocalization to allow them to experience the power of their voice, and especially how the voice reverberates in the bone and tissue conduct conduction, you know, flowing through the skull, the cheeks, the head, the neck, the chest, when lips are closed, this vibrational state is enormously powerful that can enhance the meditative state, help quieting the mind, especially if they're focused on the tone that they're creating, and feel and not just hear their voice, the sound, and that brings calmness. It's for the same reason when we're in pain, we moan and hum. That is soothing. It, it quiets things down. So I go with, with the physics aspect of what the voice is trying to do. And then from there onward, I start playing instruments as they are focused on the sound of these instruments. 
in, in a meditative way to go into a place of being, a place where they become disconnected from the monkey mind, from the awareness of the self, the egoic mind. It's called hypnagogic state, where the mind is awake, but there are no thoughts. It's probably the only time we're being a human being, otherwise we're human doings, we're always doing really, things, yeah. thinking and micro thoughts and you know, multitasking, even when we're sitting still, but there's a lot of activity in the head. I'm trying to alleviate him from this unnecessary uh, waste of energy and, and being involved in things that create the stress, create the complication in life and create a difficult inner world, which we project and becomes part of the outer world. How can the music help this to reach uh, more awareness during these sessions? Music is an enormously powerful tool and that's why humans use it in all realms, in the religious, the shamanic, the traditional, in Eastern philosophies, the chants, and we use it in films, commercials, and stores, and weddings, and parties. And if it's not really important, we wouldn't use it. Humans are driven by intuitive intelligence. Why? Because it changes the way we're being. It evokes feelings and emotions, actions. Uh, if we, it, this process is called entrainment. So let's say if we're sitting and in the presence of other people and having like a cocktail gathering, and music is playing in the background and we're talking about light stuff, nothing serious. As we're talking, we become influenced by the music. After a while, you start to see people nodding their head, tapping the hand, the feet, that's entrainment. Uh, it means the music that they're listening to is changing how they feel inside the physics of sound, acoustics, and all the attributes of what is <clears throat> part of the music is affecting how they're being on the mental, emotional, physical, energetic, and spiritual level. The more attention they have to that music, the more they're being entrained. Like in churches and synagogues and mosques, they use music to help people go inward and feel God, experience God. Music in a film entrains you. It puts you in a different mood. So yeah. that's the function of music, that it changes our being. It helps us change our mind. So it's an influence. It's an influencer, and you can do so much with that if you know how to use it. It en ends up by being the most powerful tool because it's everywhere, and it's the most popular, indispensable art. What's uh, the mathematics <clears throat> behind this and the science? Yeah. A uh, big part of the intelligence behind sound, which is... The power that music has comes from something called the harmonic series. This is the place where the concept of harmony comes from. So the harmonic series is a series of infinite frequencies bound together by a series of infinite mathematical ratios. And humans who use sound for a therapeutic modality anywhere in the world, whether in contemporary days or in ancient days, whether they're aborigines in Australia who used didgeridoos and bull roarer seeking harmonics, or people who work with gongs, singing bowls, discs and bells, overtone singing, or people who create instruments with a uh, certain buzzing mechanism that brings out the overtones or the rattling and shaking like in shakers and rattles, percussion instruments. All of these things bring out the concealed aspect of harmony the harmonic series. The harmonic series exists because it gives us the quality, the different quality of the timbre or tone color. That's how okay. our voice is different from each other. Timbre creates a difference between the sound of a note, particular note played on a flute and another, the same note, same register note played on a violin or on a guitar. People recognize that it's different because of the harmonics. They color the sound. But you don't hear these harmonics. You think it's one note, but there are there's predominantly one note that's called the fundamental frequency, and it's colored by these fine harmonics that give you a different quality of the note. This is what the harmonic series does. When we play these instruments that I mentioned earlier, gong, singing, yeah. we start to hear these overtones, and we reawaken the self to harmony because we're being exposed to the mathematical constants that these frequencies are communicating, and that causes us to be impacted by the sound of a singing bowl or a gong or a didgeridoo in a very different way. And we go inward, we become quiet, poised, calm, disconnected from the monkey mind. And the more attention we give it, 
the more of grounding and recalibration, snapping into grid, and we go to a place where some people call it the sacred. Sacred. Which is disconnected from duality, going into non-dual, and we feel inner feeling of presence of divine eventually in certain rituals and extended and that doesn't come right away of course one has to give it some time and and know how to do inner work and in some cases people use psychedelics to get to that state like what we do in shamanism so in, you must uh, sit these yeah. states for a very important thing and I, which i've been studying what is for us to learn is it like uh, often that you can <coughs> reach um this what you call some people would call them like uh, alternate state, but you prefer to call them non-ordinary state. Is it often to reach this state when you're doing uh, sound meditation? Yeah, you can. <clears throat> you can reach them in a variety of different states, uh, different ways uh, to reach the same state. So with sound, sound and music, uh, they have uh, clearly uh, proven to us that this is the method that humans like to use the most to go into various states connected to. <clears throat> to the indigenous setting for ceremonies for healing, trans possession, or the shamanic ceremonies, or religious ceremonies, or Eastern philosophies, they tend to take us to that altered state or non ordinary state of consciousness, which we can achieve through various ways dieting, sleep deprivation, dancing, chanting, um, doing breath work, exercising making love, these are all ways of achieving a non-ordinary state of consciousness. Sometimes people call it psychedelic state or, uh, you know, altered state. I like the term that Stan Groff coined is non-ordinary state. That means let's not make of it something too foreign. This is something that we seek, but it's not commonly achieved, but it's important for us. Do you come back changed after this experience? You know, the same Some person. people come back changed. Yes, absolutely. Depends on uh, many variables of how they do the inner work, how they still the mind and become present to what this harmonic series exhibited in the instruments that are being used during the sound meditation experience with their attention, with their judicious listening, intentional, attentional. They're not going into it and hoping to be healed, but feeling harmony, reawakening to harmony, feeling how the mind quiets the noise and finds signal. That's the inner work that is needed for a person to go into a deep, powerful state that can become a mystical experience Okay. that is for outside of the norm of what we normally experience. But it's this experience that awakens us, that is very, very valuable to us, that changes us forever. And one only need to have one experience to be changed forever, which I've had multiple times. Multiple times. Yeah, in different cases and setting and absolutely. And can you, uh, um, super interesting, can you tell me like one uh, <coughs> of the major changes you had? Was it the first time where you changed the most, your first experience? The first one was when I started studying Transcendental Meditation at age 14. And I was 14? 14, Very yes. young. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I grew up in war-torn country city, Beirut, Lebanon. So <laughs> that was an investment in my sanity. Um, the first time I meditated with my teacher at the TM Center, um, he told me about what I need to do, gave me my mantra and, and told me how to use it. And he started meditating next to me. And that first deep dive into the no mind realm, the beginner's mind, a place of just pure being with no thought, no judgment, no labeling. That was very, very profound, striking because it was the first time I went there. It was not the most powerful, memorable and intense I've had. Bigger ones came later on, yeah. but that was the first very significant one that I've never experienced my consciousness in such a unique way where it's not only novel, but deeply impressive, impactful, revealing, nurturing, and just astounding. And is it this experience that led you in the past at the... Definitely was a huge 
um, invitation and and provided so much curiosity for what is out there. And my study of music as well enhanced so much this desire, my interest in the human condition and human suffering and esoteric knowledge and the nature of being and the nature of reality, all of these things started growing around that age. And the more I started learning about so many of these things, the deeper I went, the more interest and curiosity that has been going on increasingly with a, an accelerando and a, <laughs> and a crescendo sim mm. simultaneously that is still continuing to this day. And that led me to many, many discoveries and, and experiences that changed my life and, or, and, and caused me to create a practice from which I bring all of this to people. Uh, it's not just the research, but research where there's a practice that came out of the research. So something that we can apply and work with people with. The fact that uh, you were in Lebanon in a <coughs> during the war, during a terrible situation, um, had an impact also on the, the power of your experience, you think? Yes, absolutely. Because I grew up in chaos and so much violence and I didn't have a normal childhood or broke out when I was nine and I lived through almost 14 years of war up until we immigrated to the States, my parents. Living, having to adapt to terror and, and uh, irrational situation where people kill each other for various reasons and the, the insanity that humans are capable of, even though humans are capable of amazing things. Uh, that became deep curiosity for me. Why? What happens then? Why do we do that? If we're so perfect and so creative, how do we derail to this level? Um, so definitely the way I grew up impacted so much how I look at the world and what I research, what I'm interested in and in understanding. Um, as being an apprentice and student, and that drove me to learn a lot in a variety of different ways to see things differently. But ultimately what I'm trying to do is to provide to myself and others what I lacked growing up, uh, harmony, inner peace, joy, love, and sense of well-being and uh, inner safety. Fantastic. And does a uh, cessation of uh, sound meditation can um, heal also help healing uh, physical pain? Yes, everything is interconnect con interconnected. What is what we call physical is not just only physical. Physical, mental, emotional, energetic, spiritual are all interconnected. When we go through uh, hard experiences, through suffering, the body on its entirety, you know, on, on all, uh, all levels, the physical, mental, emotional, energetic, and spiritual goes out of tune. And this out of tune is almost like an instrument manifests in a state of disharmony, a state of dis-ease, disease. It's a lack of ease. So like in music, you have dissonance and consonance. Consonance is harmony. Dissonance is noise and friction and disharmony and chaos, tension and release. The yin and yang are everywhere. So when we are not in a state of balance, when we suffered so much trauma and we don't know what to do with these trauma, which our tendency, is to become attached to them as we try to push them away. And that's what creates what people call post-traumatic stress disorder. A better term for that, I believe, is post-traumatic stress injury. There's an injury where we keep bringing the past into every present moment as we try to do away with it and push it away, resist it and fight it. So we don't have the solution of how to let go of it and learn from it and move on. It echoes a lot with uh, Gabor Maté, who went uh, last May in... Uh in Kaplankaya. Uh -huh. um, yes, I heard that. What's your um, favorite instrument to play uh, <coughs> during uh, sound meditations? It depends on the moment I'm going through, but um, I like a lot mm, the singing bowl set because each singing bowl, uh, metallic singing bowl I use, have different harmonics. Each one has different harmonics and all of them have different groups of harmonics. And I'm able to paint an experience with the pure harmony by mixing and matching and blending and generating these different uh, harmonics, which are the frequencies 
that exhibit the harmonic series. So basically, I'm creating, uh, extemporizing a, a musical experience in an impromptu way using pure harmony. And if the person is listening attentively, it's a magical experience. You dissolve into harmony and inner peace, you become disconnected from the mind that wants to create the conversation to label things and the judgment. It's not just a voice, it's a call and response. There's a dialogue happening in our head all the time. You were talking also about the parasites <clears throat> that we had in our mind. Yeah. What is it exactly? <laughs> <laughs> wow, this is a deep rabbit hole. So basically, I've been studying how uh, many of the ancients talked about the presence of uh, parasitic energy that plagues the human mind, plagues consciousness. Uh, it's an ener energetic form of parasite that eventually manifests physically. Um, basically, what it does, and it's, I'll give you, first of all, some of the names that this parasite has been called. The Gnos Gnostics who wrote about it in a more sophisticated way, especially in the what became known as the Nag Hammadi Library, set of uh, codices containing 53 texts uh, describing many things, and they talked about this archon, the archon parasite, the archonic forces. <clears throat> uh, the Native American called them, uh, called it Wetiko. Gurdjieff called it the evil magician. Castaneda, in his work on shamanism, uh, called it the topic of all topics, the flyers. In esoteric Christianity, is known as the universal law. In the Arab world culture, it's called jinni, uh, the jinn, where the word jinni comes from. So they're trickster. What they do is that they create the opportunity for us to be misguided by our own perception. And we use our own faculties. We lose agency and we create evil. And this parasite feeds off of the low vibrational energy that humans create when they're in pain, when they're suffering, when they're killing each other. And it gets us to destroy the environment. This is how the Gnostics describe them in such an uncanny, precise way. And, um, and, and we would be responsible for this because it's our own capacity. So I also believe that it's actually trying to present us with an opportunity to awaken to the nature of reality, to the nature of who creates good and who creates evil. Where are they created? What is our role? in creating good and evil and that eventually brings an awareness to help humans awaken all of this is tied to another major archetype called ahriman or comes from zoroastrianism in, in farsi ahriman where the concept of the devil comes comes from and it's also manifesting now has been manifesting for several years uh, in, in form of mindless technological advancement misuse of ai and technology uh, scientific materialism, um, transhumanism, addiction to computers and gadgets, social media. So all of these are interrelated and also the dopamine related fix that, you know, social media work on and, and then consumerism. I think all of this is the same, that energetic parasites manifesting and it's tied to toxoplasmosis also, which is, this is the parasite that, um, infects rodent and the rodent eventually starts to follow where the cat is by sniffing its pee because it takes away the fear that the rodent has for the cat and eventually the rodent mouse or rat gets eaten by the cat why okay. because the parasite infects the rodent and uses it as an uber to get to the host the parasite cannot duplicate unless it's back in the host and the cat is the host and it's, wow. this is a single-celled organism with no nervous system. Couldn't be more basic. That's how diabolically intelligent parasites that we have in nature by the thousands. So they can manipulate thoroughly the, the brain of a mammal. We have a mammalian brain. Rats are very intelligent. They survived yeah. millions of years. Yeah. So we can be plagued by manipulated by a parasite with all of our intelligence not realize that otherwise how could you explain humans becoming so chaotic where an ant colony exhibits more harmony than the intelligent human species that has become very smart but wisdomless you were talking about um 
digital uh, things like uh, social medias and everything. Is electro music <coughs> real music for you? <laughs> well, it is music, but it's a different manifestation of music and different uh, creation of music. Um, while it can be beautiful, addictive, and highly desirable, and it moves people, at the end, this music, and, uh, and I'm being impartial here with no judgment, uh, I like to inform people and let yeah. people make their own decision, but I don't uh, tell people what to do. I share with them how to do it best, and I don't tell them what to think. I yeah. share with them how to think for themselves and make choices. So electronic music is created with ones and zeros. It's digital. Um, it's very limited. Why is it limited when you play an instrument, an acoustical instrument, there's the sound that comes out of the instrument is more sophisticated than the sound that comes out of a computer or synthesizer with ones and zeros where the music is quantized. This creates quantization, this creates simpler mathematics that are part of the sound. Whereas when you play an acoustical instrument, the waveform that's what we're talking about here yeah. is the actual shape of the sound the dimension is not just a two-dimensional or three-dimensional it's more than that it's more complex and that complexity impacts our consciousness on the physical mental emotional auditory spiritual levels and moves us to far greater states of being many things becomes a layer of complexity not just the sound of the instrument but the modes and the scales that i use are there scales that have been equal tempered where the octave has been divided into 12 equidistant half steps or where you can play on, on a violin between the notes because it's a fretless instrument if you have guitar where you can play only this fret or that fret or piano where there's this key and that key but nothing in between this nothing in between is the limitation so uh, many ways that can cause acoustical music to be far more impactful to our ears the body everything we are than electronic music and people have to be aware of that and learn more about it to make better choices or to listen to acoustical music and not just electronic music because even if we listen to something that uh it's not good for us and something like the stuff we used to listen to when we were in our early teens right i don't want to <laughs> name names here but we, taste is related to experience, knowledge, and understanding. So when you say music influences you, so you think <clears> like <throat> hard rock, for example, or death metal can um, encourage you to feel uh, angry? Or yes. Yes. First, or what it does, it has so a it's certain, a way to evacuate your anger. <clears throat> it has a certain level of um, goodness in it, is that it allows the person to open up to something that they have within them and it's repressed. Yeah. And to feel it by being entrained by what they're listening to and to feel it and release it and let go of it. The problem is that they become attached to it and they only want to feel it again and again. Then it becomes negative entrainment okay. that keeps them in a state of perpetual addiction to something that's angry. Okay. And this, this is not good and that's not easy to talk about because people who love this music tell you that it does them good all the time, but no, this can also entrain you negatively and keep you in that state. The value is that to visit these things, learn, but also move on and use something different, a more healthy version of entrainment. Do you listen sometimes to um, cheesy <clears throat> songs, very emotional songs when you're, uh, uh, when you're sad? That people, people listen when they're heartbroken or something like this? I do listen to such songs, but not as cheesy as one. I like to listen <laughs> to the ones that can have far greater impact on me. Which such is, as? Well, you know, many of indigenous cultures or classical music, for example, that comes from Turkey. We're in Turkey here. Turkish classical music and Persian, Arabic, Armenian. North African, Central Asian, some Indian classical music induce that feeling of um, yearning, of nostalgia and melancholy to allow the person to open up to the sadness and feel it. Because again, here with like with what we're talking about with post-traumatic stress injury, 
we try to push something away. If we're feeling sad, we push it away. We don't allow ourselves to sit and listen. The reason why people listen to blues when they're sad is that it gives them the permission to open up to the sadness and feel it. Feeling it and going so deeply into it can allow the person to move beyond it because they have spent some time in the um, allowance to feel that sadness without wanting to push it away and get rid of it. Mourning is important after death of someone, allowing the person, the self, to feel the sadness and open up to it and not just handle it awkwardly and try to move beyond it very quickly. Giving the time for the entrainment so that we don't hold on to it. If we hold on to it, then it's in the subconscious mind, which influences the conscious mind most of the time. A very high percentage. We need to deal with the material that we push into the subconscious mind. And music is a great tool to help us deal with that. Meditation, contemplation, and in, in some cases also the use of music and psychedelics or sound and psychedelics together. This is the medicine of the future. This is absolutely... They go well together, music yes, and uh, psychedelics. This is what humans use to create shamanism. But there's lack of understanding because there's a lot of stories in shamanic societies, etc. But at the end, you have humans who are gravitating to use the two most powerful tools. Sound, when I say sound, chants, words, and psychedelics. And that helps us hack human consciousness in a way to do the healing, the revealing, the revitalization, rehabilitation, regeneration, allowing the self-healing process. That's at the end what's going on, as I understand it, having studied these things thoroughly, practiced them, received them. So we saw like um, sound meditation can sometimes be like an um, individual uh, journey, but uh, you studied music. How can uh, music also bring people together? Um, music is always used in any form of, uh, any gathering, any form of, where you have an assembly, group of people coming together. People are involved um, in praising God in traditional settings and indigenous settings and prayers and celebrations, all sorts of cer ceremonies. Um, because community is something that exhibits form of harmony cohabitation agreeing tolerance support and sense of belonging together that connects people of certain ideology race culture religion all of these things unfortunately quite often they're used to separate people but they're trying to bring people together and that's our ignorance that causes us to find systems that makes money, create systems that make money out of making people separate and disconnected. We're waking up to harmony. And uh, in this case, music brings people together. And why? Because the driving force behind it, harmony, comes from the harmonic series, which, as I said earlier, harmonic series is a series that has an infinite frequencies that exist in one system bound together by a series of infinite mathematical ratios connecting these frequencies together. So the harmonic series can inspire us a lot in creating a more authentic harmony by understanding the bigger system that we come from, the cosmos, the logos, nature, and the forces in them. Did you ever meet people for some reason who cannot be penetrated by music, like who have an obstacle in front of music, of the sounds and everything? Can it they, yeah, there are some people, but that is because they are stuck in their mind and they don't have the tools to fathom in what's going on in music. They don't know what to make out of it. They hear it like you and I, but their processing is not the same. Their absorption and their fathoming and allowing the music that has an ethos to create pathos within us. And that's how this process creates reality, whether it's words or music. 
everything that we say has an ethos, distinguishing quality, character, personality. When we hear it, it creates an inner reality. And this is how sound becomes God. Sound creates reality. Yeah. Alexandre uh, will ask with um, la- will finish with the last question, uh, the same question that I'm uh, asking to all the guests. It's um, the harvest of the day. If something could be done, uh, easy or simple, that would make the world a better place, what would it be for you? Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> it's hard to pick one. I'm going to pick two. <laughs> <laughs> you, can, you have okay. the choice. <laughs> Listen to good music and learn about what what is good music and learn learn about music. Listen to something different from what you listen to. Discover new things and you'll be guided by an inner process within you that would get you to discover more and more of where music can take you and how it can impact you. And it changes the wiring in the brain. That's what deep listening does or playing instrument. The other one... I would say go inwards, develop spiritual practice, meditate. The answers are within. And that's what we need to do is to change the way we create this reality and resort to more uh, connection to the heart, to the healthy side of the feminine, compassion, empathy, kindness, love, intuition, imagination, inspiration. And these are the things we find when we quiet the busy mind and go inwards and do inner work and become involved in authentic spirituality and these practices to sculpt the self and tune the self. Music can still be involved. Of course, there is. You can combine them together. Even better? Even better. Yeah. Combine all the tools that works together, the most powerful tools. Thank you very much, Alexandre, for being with us. Thank you. Pleasure, Rose.